the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. In the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all of the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him, and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak, because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon 
And those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go on your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but he was outside in deserted places and they came to him from every direction. Now let's look at some faith lessons and some big ideas from Mark chapter one. Now Mark chapter one is divided into five main segments. First we'll see in verses one through eight that the ministry of Jesus and his life begins and has its foundations in the Old Testament. It says in verses one and two, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So we see the prophecy being fulfilled in the life of Jesus. So the Old Testament is the foundation to the New Testament. And you can't really understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. And prophecy sets apart the Bible like any other writings to mankind. For example, just regarding Christ's first coming, there are over 300 specific prophecies regarding Christ's first coming. For example, where he would be born, how he would die, how he would minister, not a bone of his body would be broken. All of this shows and fulfills prophecy and that the Bible is true. Once again, prophecy sets apart the Bible like no other writing known to mankind. So what about us? Do we believe that the Bible is fully inspired and do we trust in God's word with all of our heart? This is the first big faith lesson, that the prophecies of the Old Testament are fulfilled in the New Testament and Christ fulfills these. So do we trust, once again, God's Word, do we fully put our weight upon it? Because we can and we should. Then we see in verses 9 through 11, we see the baptism of Jesus. Now Jesus was perfect and he did not need to confess any sins. In fact, the part of the reason for baptism was a repentance, was a confession of sin. Jesus was perfect. He did not need to confess any sins. However, he was baptized to be an example for us and to give God an opportunity to speak audibly and to give credibility that Jesus was God's Son, the Messiah, the Sent One, to minister and to live on this earth and to die for our sins. So Jesus was baptized in order to fulfill these prophecies and show that He was the Son of God and to be an example for us that all of us should be baptized. So what about us? Have we been baptized? If we haven't, we should. Now baptism doesn't save us. However, it is a command and it is a declaration that we are now becoming a follower of Christ, that we are repenting of our sins and that we are now choosing to follow Christ. So if you have not been baptized, then you should do so. If at all possible, you should do so. Then we come to verses 12 and 13, and then we see here the testing of Jesus in the desert for 40 days and for 40 nights. Now some versions of the Bible will say he was tempted, 
The tempting is similar or synonymous with the word tested. So Jesus was tested or tempted in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights to show some significant important truths. One that he could pass any test, the most grueling, the most difficult, the most severest test he could overcome and pass. Also it showed that he was 100% God, and, but yet he was 100% man. He suffered real hunger, he was lonely, it was cold, it was very difficult for 40 days and 40 nights. This also shows that he can now become our high priest. He has every right to become our high priest. He can identify with us and he can now become our high priest and petition on, on our behalf because he understands how we feel and he can forgive us and help us in our times of need. Now what about us? Now God will test us as well. It says in James 1, 2 through 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. So part of God's testing and trials is so that we can be perfect and complete, becoming a mature believer who can overcome, who can walk strong, who can stand tall, and who can live and conduct their lives in a mature, godly way, not up and down, not having you know highs and lows and walking with God and falling away, but a steady, mature believer who follows Christ in a strong, steady way. So that's part of what trials do. Now also, regarding Jesus, part of his testing and his overcoming of these trials gives him the right, as we mentioned, to become our faithful high priest so that he can help us. And it says in Hebrews 4, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So because Christ overcame, was tested, overcame, was, was sinless, then he has every right to be our high priest and he can help us in our times of need. So we should go to him and ask him for help. So what about us? Are we standing strong during the trials? Are we running from our trials? Or are we embracing our trials? And in our trials, are we going to Christ asking him for help, he's our high priest, asking him for help to find grace and mercy and help in time of need. Then we come to the fourth section of Mark chapter one, and we see verses 14 through 20, and what we see here is that Jesus begins his ministry and he carefully calls his 12 disciples. Now interestingly, all of these disciples, it says in Acts 1, 10, and 11 that all of these disciples were from the Galilee area. However, about six of them were called right along the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. So he begins his ministry and he calls his disciples. Now interestingly, he's going to call one disciple, Judas, whom he knows is going to betray him. Now God in his sovereignty allowed this so that scripture could be fulfilled. However, Judas was still held accountable for his choices and his sins. So God will use the choices of people. He will even use evil in his good purposes. So Jesus carefully chose his disciples, began his ministry in these verses 14 through 20. So what about us? Even though we don't understand maybe what God's doing, we don't understand the evil that is happening in the world, do we trust God rest in his sovereignty that he is working out his good and perfect purposes in our lives and in the big picture of the course of the world. Now we come to the last section of Mark chapter 1 and these have to do with verses 21 through 45. And what we're going to see in this large section here is just a numerous amount of amazing miracles that Jesus is going to do. And these miracles are going to show that Jesus is Lord over every aspect of creation and that he is the true Messiah. He is God in the flesh. He is all powerful. He is almighty. And he now works 
these amazing miracles. So we just see a few here. He cast out a demon. He shows he is Lord over the demonic realm. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He's Lord over our bodies, over sickness. He healed multitudes. Multitudes came to him and he healed them. And then he preached all around the Galilee area. And later he would preach wider than that. His ministry was huge and he had thousands and thousands of people that would follow him. We know that there were 5,000 besides the women and children, so if we add on them and others, we can probably get crowds of at least 15 to 20 to 25,000 people that followed Jesus. His ministry was, was enormous and his impact was just amazing as he ministered and healed people. Now part of the reason for these miracles, again, was to show that Jesus was the Messiah. He was God Almighty in the flesh. He was the promised one to come. And so these miracles show all of this. And in Isaiah 9, 6, we see clearly that Jesus was God in the flesh. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called, listen carefully, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So Jesus is called Everlasting Father, Almighty God. So we can believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, all-powerful, the promised Messiah, and so these miracles affirm this. So what about us? Do we believe that Jesus is the Messiah? He is the Christ. He is the promised one to come. He came to die for our sins. He came to rise from the dead to show that he could give us new life. So do we believe that? Have we put our trust in Christ as our Lord and Savior? Have we received his gift of salvation? And do we believe that Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Why could he say that? Because Jesus was God. He was the creator. He created all things as it says in John 1, 1 and 2. So he has every right to say that he is the only way to salvation. So these are some faith lessons that we can take away from Mark chapter 1. So thank you for watching and may God richly bless you.